wish I was in my shed sitting down, down. I wish I was in my shed sitting down. You know what? I am in my shed sitting down. I'm catching my breath because I literally have carried almost 20 guitars into the shed for this exciting episode. Yes, it's a resonator. Okay, so what am I doing in here? Well, as usual, I'm multitasking. I am actually, this is Santa's workshop because I am, what's up with these glasses? I'm not that old. Anyway, I am working on this guitar in Santa's workshop, AKA the shed. This is Lefty, the junk pile arch top. You'll see a playlist depending on when you watch this video. One will pop up up there, but shh, this is Tammy's Christmas present. I have to have it done by Christmas Eve. So Tammy does not have to play upside down right-handed arch tops like Elizabeth Cotton. So. This episode, as the title suggests, is called Baby Boomer Christmas Catalog Guitars. I have been thinking about doing this episode uh, for a while, and you're going to see a lot of guitars, and we're going to give you some resources here. Ooh, ah. There's always going to be something down in the description section below called resources and maybe even a link to an artist or two. But let's start off here. When did guitars become really, really popular and what was probably the first string instrument that came became really popular in the United States and how? Well, it was the mandolin, 1910 on until about 1920. Some salesman was going along stopping at a school and saying, here, here's a free mandolin. And, oh, by the way, it would be really cool if your school bought enough mandolins. You're seeing people uh, do this now with ukuleles and the resurgence of music and art programs in school districts, including the one I serve on. Anyway, there would be mandolin orchestras where everybody in town literally was strumming a mandolin and it was very cool because back then you did not have a television you were barely having a radio but you didn't certainly have one of these contraptions so you actually had to find something to do to entertain yourself rather than this so what does all this have to do with Christmas catalog guitars? Well, let's go back into the vintage guitar. Let's call it that. Of say the 1930s. This is the Archcraft Junk Pile. You know it well. There's a playlist up there of everything we did to it. I lent it out. I think I lent it out to a trash blues player who needed to cover up the F holes so it didn't feed back. Turn your amp the other way, stand over here. And now we're gonna have to, after I pulled the gaffer tape off of it, we're gonna have to use some tea or something to put this back, but uh, yeah. Oh, by the way, when you drill holes to put new tuners in the headstock, go a little bit each way so you don't blow that out. Anyway, this guitar, was made between 1933 and 1934 by K under the name Archcraft. Now, you've seen this one, it had holes in it, so we did that to it. We did binding to it, we did all kinds of stuff to it. We put a pickup on it and it actually plays okay. Anyway, about this time, you had big band orchestras. So, you're sitting in a big band orchestra with horns and 
everything under the earth and you have a guitar like this, you're, they're not going to hear you. They are not going to hear you. Um, so there really wasn't much demand for people playing uh, in orchestras that had a guitar because you couldn't solo with one. Everything else drowned you out. And I want you to think about what people did for entertainment back then. There were a lot of dance venues where there were big bands, uh, elements of a big band, uh, horns, drums, singers, that kind of stuff. And people actually used to go there and dance. And then you had some radio and you would hear music on the radio. But again, it was Benny Goodman type stuff. Um, and guitars really didn't start to come into popularity until they got louder. And you could hear them through the din of everything else, or you could solo on one. But back in the 1930s, the people that were buying this kind of guitar were the people that could not afford a Gibson. And these things were pretty expensive even back then. You'll hear stories about, oh, the guitar was $15. Well, think about how much money that is now. I think I will give you a link to a conversion chart down below, if I can remember. Anyway, 89 years old, Archcraft made by K. Now, moving ahead, most of the guitars you would see being played, um, I don't want to say that a juke joint was the only place where a guitar was being played, but if you were playing, especially at a gathering, um, you had to have something loud, and that's where arch tops and resonators came in to play because these things would ring out. This is not a vintage, this is a thing is loud. By the way, this is a Gretsch um, Bobtail, I think it is. It's a pretty good guitar. It's heavy. It's certainly not a national or some of the other ones, but yeah. So in order to play a guitar, you needed uh, uh, something that was going to be loud. So that's where arch tops came from. That's where steel body resonators came from. Again, they weren't cheap. I don't care what anybody says. So moving along, Radio was a big thing through the 30s, and televisions were actually invented. The, what we would call electronic, we're not talking about digital or anything like that, but the first one was invented in 1927. By 1940, there were a few of them showing up. The color TV shows started showing up about 57 or 58. So what does all this have to do with Baby Boomer guitars. Well, first thing I want to tell you is Baby Boomers, the age is about 1945 to 1965. Believe it or not, I actually fit in that category. And yeah, I'm doing really good. I can't help it how you're doing. As if I were you, I'd hate to be me, yeah. Anyway, so by 1940, you still had guitars basically looking like this, no amplification. This is a 1940 Harmony Patrician. You can tell it's a 1940 because I've told you before, somebody in corporate decided, I'm only going to put binding on the top side, and that's going to save me money and labor. So by 1940, even in the better uh, mahogany-bodied guitars of the time, you are starting to see how do we mass produce these things to make them cheaper. I will tell you this, if you're going to spot a pre-Baby Boomer, or in other words, pre-World War II guitar, um, and you're picking up an arch top somewhere, the dead giveaway on these things is the V-neck. It comes to a V, so you would be playing. If you actually like using a slide where you're keeping your finger in the slide flat across here, the V-neck is good, but this 1940 guitar and this 1933-1934 guitar have V-necks. The Archcraft by K is a little bit more clubbier in baseball bat, but nonetheless, V-neck. When you see a Bakelite bridge, definitely, definitely 
pre-1940, this archcraft has a Bakelite bridge. So, how did people communicate what they had for you to buy? Well, real easy. It was called a mail order catalog. So, um, you saw a split in the 30s, and we've talked about, um, there was an episode I did, I'll give you a link to it. We talked about John D'Angelico and um, different people um, making copies of Gibsons, and then some people decided, uh, for Cillo, decided to go into the American Guitar uh, Company, and then you had K and Harmony, and um, I want to tell you real quick about these a couple of books. Now, they are not fine references, they're not ID guides, but the histories of cool guitars, guitar stories, there are several volumes of these, um, but the K guitars are featured in volume two of this. It's pretty pricey, but it's got a lot of different pictures. Um, shows you catalog pictures. You're gonna need one of these to look the book over and possibly some of these if you're my age. Anyway, if you look at Harmony stuff, there's uh, Ron Rothman did a book called Harmony, the People's Guitar. That's kind of a telling um, title there because Kay and Harmony put a lot of guitars, thousands and thousands of guitars into people who were suddenly seeing and hearing what was the blues on phonographs, rock and roll. It's kind of funny how phonographs have come back. So you have 78 vinyls, all of that, then they died out when CDs come back out. And now everybody's after those records again. In fact, I'm seeing a Furry Lewis record um, that I would just love to get. Uh, but these 78s are now 1,000, 2,000 on up for a single record. Anyway, back to what was going on. I'm just kind of babbling on here, but um, if you watch my channel, a lot of this stuff is going to be a repeat to you. But again, you were at, radio was on, uh, the press was a big thing, catalogs were a big thing, and you started to hear music going into the late 30s and early 40s, that was coming out of basically Delta Blues, and you were hearing guitars finally, either acoustic guitars uh, put out through vinyls where you could hear the guitarist and maybe a drummer or something like that. But a lot of solo stuff, Sunhouse stuff, Robert Johnson. Those are the people that put your ear towards the guitar and gave you the idea that you could quit air guitaring. I don't know when that was invented, but somebody was smart enough to say I gotta make an economical guitar so kids want them for Christmas. So the average person knew that their kid was not going to pick up a Gibson L5 that they paid the equivalent of again uh, it might be $300 it might be $500 back then you're talking about a lot of money coming out of the depression especially in the start of uh, the post-war period, 1945-1946. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to start showing you guitars that kind of go through that time frame. We're going to take a look at some of them. I'm going to tell you what I know about them, who made them, what the model number was, and give you some characteristics that you can look for when you run across these things, because these things were made literally by the thousands but some of them were made so cheap that they don't survive. So I'm going to go through a bunch of guitars here, and we're going to see some surprises. And uh, this is a Sunday. I hate to do this to you. You should go to confession right now. Put it on pause. Put it on confession because the amount of coveting you're going to do right now is far beyond anything you've ever did, did done, did. Yeah. So let's start looking at guitars. Okay, before I pull the first one up, I want to tell you about Nathaniel Adams. I'm going to give you a link to him below. This guy, I don't think he's very old. Um, I'm not the definition of old, by the way. Maybe you are, but not me. Um, you know, while I'm at this, I looked at the age demographic on my channel, 
and this is all people over 65 years old, um, you, if you're, especially if you're young, you need to subscribe because I, I literally could have my subscribers literally dropping like flies, literally dropping like flies. So you need to replace them because I'm dealing with an older, uh, more mature demographic. So I'll give you a like. Anyway, you can get on the internet and you can find um, this. It basically tells you every guitar K ever made, who they made it for, uh, both K and Harmony were jobbers for other people. You would see them making guitars for Sears, Montgomery Ward, Spiegel, Western Auto. That's what True Tone means if you see that one. Just a ton of different people. But they kept, unlike the American Guitar Company, who uh, was a jobber for everybody and never put out their own guitars per se, K and Harmony would release models under their own names. But you can get on the internet and find basically year, model number, uh, common names or trade names of certain guitars that uh, both Harmony and K did. But look up Nathaniel Adams on Facebook and on his website. There is literally an encyclopedia of anything that's an Econo Arch Top on up again, uh, link down in the description. So let's start hauling some guitars in here. Okay, I zoomed out a little bit in hopes that you'd be able to see more of the body of the guitar and I can just sit here. Um, how are the Packers doing? Oh, never mind. It's almost the end of 2022. But clarification, we're only going to talk about arch tops here. Very seldom do I do anything with a flat top guitar. Um, you've seen me do a Russian guitar and um, Rob's restoration of a... Uh, what was a knockoff of a Gibson Hummingbird? Um, do I have any cards left? If not, just do the search. I'll give you a link up there maybe. But if you're going to get into um, looking at arch tops and trying to figure out what they are, you're going to need one of these. And then look at this flashlight. This thing is awesome. It folds. It lights up this way. There's two settings there. It folds this way, this way, and what's really cool is there's a light on the end there where you can just, well, at least there was. There it is. You can put this down an F hole. It's very narrow. You can bend it around, light up the whole interior, but you are going to need one of these and one of these. So let's start with what I call the student model guitar. I'm going to show you two guitars here um, because I'm going to kind of differentiate for you. When I run across a guitar that sometimes is too good for me to junk pile up, I'm not interested in it unless I get a real, um, uh, get it for a good price. There's probably something wrong. The back of it's coming off. It's cracked. Uh, um, because when you get these in really good shape, you never really are going to restore them and get your money out of them. Okay, so by student model, what I'm going to say is, look here at the fingerboard is right on top of the neck. Uh, there might be three millimeters distance there. So historically, the strings on these were inherently up high. Um, you'd start on something like this, just strumming. And if you were going to get good at fretting this, especially way down in here, you were going to have calluses on the ends of your fingers. This uh, guitar was made by Harmony. It's a model H992. Um, guys, get these tags and hang them on your guitar and identify them. I also have color code dots that tell me what I'm going to do with these. So I have an inventory. I look at the wall. Somebody wants a junk pile. Somebody wants a little bit better guitar. But this I'm going to call a student instrument. They were at the bottom of the line in prices of the arch tops. Of course, there were flat tops that were cheaper. But again, there is no room. The fingerboard is right on top of the body. Um, high action, not fine playing. Now, I like the paint job they did. They looked like burnt maple, and they would do these fancy paint jobs and put some binding on some of them. Other ones would have only 
no binding or painted binding. But here's an example of one. It's got a three millimeter uh, right on top of the fingerboard. These strings are way up high on this thing. This needs a neck reset, you think, or worse than that, this is caving in on the body. But this is not a guitar I would junk pile out. Um, it's got some glue to do. The back is coming off of it. I'm going to use this guitar in an episode to show you how to clean up a guitar really fast using simple tricks that you don't have to put a lot of effort into it. But this one is not one that I would junk pile up too bad because with a little bit of work it can be made to look normal. But again, these were the low end of arch tops in the Christmas catalog. Dead giveaway. Fingerboard is thin and sits right on top of the body. All right, I'm going to show you one more, what I'm calling a student model um, from the 1940s. A Harmony, Butterbean Tuners. This one is in pretty good shape. You can tell someone played this a lot. Uh, people don't trim their fingernails and they um, dig into the fretboard. Uh, but this one had painted binding and um, it looks like a better guitar than it really is. But again, in making decisions about junk piling a guitar this one can be fixed up and sent down the road and be a player for somebody economically i certainly wouldn't destroy um, this guitar you can tell that the bridge on it is not the original bridge and it has been um, taken down quite a bit there's not much room on these student instruments because again the fingerboard fretboard is literally three millimeters off the deck all right, now let's move up into the next, say, classification of guitars. And this one is going to give us a little bit more room to work with because there is more fingerboard on the neck to work with. So there's usually a piece of wood under here. So we flip this around. Hey, Metricator, Merry Christmas. Now we're talking about 12 millimeters or 14 millimeters off the top of the arch top and you'll notice that this part sinks down a little bit if you ever see one that's kind of caving back and you think the neck is still okay but it's caving back sometimes that's because there's a crack forming right here this piece of wood is not attached they usually put it in you can see that there will be a crack developing right there and sometimes the block of wood that's inside here that attaches the sides and the neck and everything is starting to come loose. If it comes loose, especially at the bottom, you'll see this starting to cave in on itself. So look at that if there's a problem. But there's a lot more room to work with. Now this one, I got a hold of. It's in okay shape. Somebody did a neck reset on it that I think leaves something to be desired. The back of it is coming off. But this is what they looked like in the factory before somebody got the fancy spray paint templates out and did what they did. And I've got a couple examples of that. But this is a common Harmony H1214. This is from 1962, believe it or not. This is a tad over 60 years old. So that model number you're going to see popping up everywhere. It's again uh, collected from the inside of the guitar. Now, here's one that somebody got cool with tri tiger stripe in it trying to make it look like maple the binding is still painted on um, it had a uh, a pit guard this is all original stuff on here but again you can tell that that deck is up a little bit higher I still have some room um, to adjust this down try to try to get away from a neck set this is a Harmony H1214 from early 1960. This guitar is as old as me. I don't know what happened to you, son, where you don't look like this. But I'll light a candle for you. Now, this guitar is in great shape. I wouldn't do anything to it um, other than clean it up a little bit and get the pick guard back on it. Now, we also have one here that's just a tad older, but this one is the same guitar 
same model number, 1214, H1214 mean harmony from 1957, but it's a silver tone. This was made for Sears, exactly the same thing, painted binding. This one still has the pit guard, uh, same bridge, same everything. This one needs a neck reset, plus there's a little bit of something happening here opening up. Um, I want to give a shout out to Cody Harrell. I've made a few guitars uh, for him that are license plates and, and junk like that, but uh, Cody made sure that I got this one and we're going to fix this one up and have it stay as original as possible. But what's happening here is this piece of wood right here, you can see a split right there. The fingerboard is becoming separated. I will tell you, especially on these intermediate level stuff, this was not the cheapest one, but it certainly wasn't the most expensive one. This is the one that you will find in most garages and stuff. Um, they were made pretty tough, but the first time you put big strings on this and try to pretend you're a blues artist running 58s and 60s, you will literally crater the neck off of one of these. But this is the what I call the intermediate model. Again, if you get something like this, try to keep it nice. Most of these end up with pickups in them so they can become functional. But I try to tell people, whatever you do, Try to use surface mount pickups. Do I have one here? Yes. Okay, made these things. They just mount right on the top there like so. Uh, two small holes, one for the wire, and you're good to go. So if you're going to do something with one of these intermediate models, try to make it reversible. Okay, let's stick with Harmony again. And I want to tell you about, I have two of these guitars. Um, they're in different condition. One of them, somebody actually tried to bedazzle it with some little jewels or something by drilling some holes in here when they um, glued the top back on or something. But this is a Harmony Model H1215. Um, these are 60s vintage guitars. The other one is a 1966 guitar. Um, these ended up being the workhorse of a lot of the blues guys uh, down in the Delta in North Mississippi that I study. And you will see when they came back into the picture after the folk revival of the 1960s, they were playing a guitar like this. For example, do you know who Kenny Brown is? If you don't, I'm going to give you a link below. So Cody Harrell, Kenny Brown, North Mississippi, they all know each other. Um, Kenny Brown... Um, learned how to play from Mississippi Joe Cal Calicut. And look at this guitar on the front cover. This is the same, not the exact same guitar, but the same model of guitar. You have the two stripes, the headstock, uh, logo badge is the same, all painted on stuff. But he was using this guitar when George Mitchell took this picture in 1967. This is a great book, Mississippi Hill Country Blues, 1967, by George Mitchell. You should have asked for this one on your Christmas list. There's always next year. I'm going to give you a link on how to get this below. But even more interesting is this record, which came out in the... Any two records for 588? Really? I wish that were the case because I didn't pay that for this. But if you look closely, look at the hat, look at the shirt, look at the guitar. This was all done, recorded pictures right up the same day in 1967. Don't discount these mid level quality harmonies because they were responsible for a lot of the blues mu music you hear and the folk revival in which the old man blues recorders from the 1930s and even 20s came back and used this guitar to establish their career. There was no, I'm a full-time musician and everybody rediscovered me and I'm on the world tour with the Rolling Stones. There was none of that. It was still an intermediate level catalog guitar that put them back on the map 
where they produce the kinds of records we'll pay hundreds of dollars for now. Oh, hey, did I forget to tell you? I went on and on about Kenny Brown. Did I forget to tell you that Kenny Brown learned how to play guitar from Mississippi Joe Calica, who was his neighbor? There we go. So, I think I've dispelled a couple of myths here by teaching you Socratically, where you learn on your own, that the idea that... Uh, K made silver tone and harmony made something else. These people would go to whoever with a specification and say, we need this guitar in this color or this for this Christmas. And these jobbers would make the guitars. So I'm saving some of the best, which is really kind of the worst until the end. But let's jump into K now. Um, you will see some Ks that have stamps inside that say N2, uh, K1, N4. Um, we're sticking again with the intermediate level guitars that have space. Now, a K, if you look, there's a gap. Let me grab Chick Flick Teal Pointer. Unlike a Harmony, the Ks have a gap right here, under here. I kind of like that because I've told you that if something starts cutting loose in here, this will pitch down. And the more pressure you have over the greater surface, the more it's likely to do that. This actually has some room to kick back with air underneath it. I don't know that it's stronger. It doesn't appear so because this neck needs to be reset. But this is a K model 6836. Uh, made from 1959 to about 1961. Again, under the name K, they again saved some of their guitars and didn't put names on them. Like Airline, like this one, for example. This is the exact same guitar, same space, same everything, except I hot rotted this one up. It's got a piezo and a pickup, and yeah, Bob Log the Third has played this guitar. Is there a video up there? If not, there will be a link down in the description below. So Kay made one for Airline, and then reaching over here, we have the same series, 6886, an N2 body, from the mid 1960s same everything this one has binding they all have binding but this one was made for sears and has a silver tone label on it so the tuners and everything are okay you saw a lot of people that made a living playing in bars every day and had music as a second job using this type of k guitar for their everyday player Okay, let's move up in quality just a little bit. But before we do that, I want to tell you that the Gibsons of this area now, era, now we're talking late 40s, 50s, and into the 60s, acoustic guitars weren't really that popular anymore for the mainstream. And so the ones that were okay were the ones that were loud, which means on an arch top, a bigger body. So... Following Gibson and Gibson's Super 400 and the body styles with the cutouts and stuff, um, before we dive into that world and the world of electric guitars, let's talk about one of the biggest, most dependable models that Harmony put out, and that was the Harmony Monterey. Now, I think the Monterey started off being, let me make sure I don't turn anything over because I'm starting to get into a little bit better guitars here. The Harmony Monterey was H1456, H1456. This one is from the late 40s. It's in really rough shape. Um, everything is rusty on it. Um, it doesn't claim to have a reinforced neck or a fake truss rod cover. Uh, and it's pretty beat up. And if you look at the binding, the binding is pretty cool. It's got... Um, an outside binding and then a ring of what looks like uh, 
herring bone or something there. This one's really cool. It's really beat up. It's going to take a lot of work. The back's starting to come off of it. You can see that the neck is moving. And that is what I'm talking about where things start to cut loose on that block. You got to kind of look at, remember, I'm an arborist. So I kind of look at trees. They don't just all of a sudden start doing what they're doing. There's time and effect and compensation growth or whatever. But whenever you see a neck flexing like this, this one's about ready to come out, which will be okay because then I can fix it. But when there's stress on that and it's pulling back when the strings are on, that's going to manifest itself right here. So when you're looking at a guitar and you kind of wonder, again, I did an episode about, I'm going to have to pick my cards now, about a buyer's guide to e Econo Arch Tops. Maybe there's a card up there. If not, look through my channel. Uh, there's a playlist called something like that. When you're going out and looking at these guitars, if something is starting to work loose, remember when the strings are on, it's going to pull this way, especially if they're heavy. These big bodied arch tops, people would put heavy strings on them. And so when you see this cutting loose, look at this area. If there's cracks here, the binding is kind of what will tell you what's going on in the surface, kind of like the bark on a leaning tree. The tree leans, the bark is being stretched this way and compressed on the downside of it. So if it all of a sudden starts leaning more, the bark starts popping up or you see bark falling on the ground on the other side where it's crumpling up. That's a sign. Guitars will manifest themselves the same way. This block comes out to here. So if you start to see binding crack here and here, it's a dead giveaway. Anyway, this is a Harmony Monterey from the late 40s. And then we move up into one that was made a little bit later. And this is a nice instrument. I got this one from Rob uh, at Guitar 48. He redid it, set it up. But it's beautiful and it plays nice. The action on it is nice. But the Harmony Monterey was kind of like uh, Harmony's top end acoustic guitar. So if you're a rich kid, your parents thought they were doing you a favor by buying the best uh, Harmony had to offer in the Monterey. Of course, once you get on the street, the kids are like, dude, you didn't get a Gibson. What are you doing here? It's still all fake. And that was kind of the joke in the background. Now, let's start moving into the stuff that everybody wanted, uh, both at Christmas and now. Okay, here we go. Welcome to the rich kid's house on Christmas morning. By the, by the mid-50s, going into the 60s, um, rock and roll was blowing up. Elvis Presley was singing big boy crud of stuff. You had Howlin' Wolf and Muddy Waters singing the old Delta North Mississippi Blues classic, classics to electric guitars. And the cool kids got an electric guitar. Now there was a ton of electric guitars. I'm just going to show you a few of the ones I have. And let's start by talking about the pickup. Uh, Hershey bar, Kleenex box, soap bar, whatever you want to call it. Just a small, thin surface mount pickup that would go on top of a K, a Harmony. They both had their own kinds of pickups, but they were pretty simple. Nowadays, if you want a pickup that's going to uh, fit under the strings on one of those uh, fingerboards that has wood underneath it. This is still the choice. Um, but in terms of guitars, again, just what I happen to have laying around. Let's look at one that was just basically an intermediate acoustic guitar with a pickup on it and um, a set of controls and a jack. Welcome to the Harmony Hollywood. Hey, Hollywood. Yeah. <laughs> it's a mid-level <laughs> mid class guitar. It's got the big old clubby neck, uh, but they put a pickup on it. And I'll tell you what, Christmas morning, if you got one of these, you were cool. Not a Gibson, <laughs> not a Fender. But this is about as cool as you're going to get. I, I guarantee you there's a bunch of people running with the name Hollywood and they don't know why they got it. Your parents did you well if you got this one. Moving right along. Let me see here. This one was called the Brilliant. 
don't discount that. I know that you guys are used to brilliant from watching my channel. But anyway, this is the Harmony Brilliant. This is a big body guitar. Uh, this one is the H1310, Harmony 1310. And it was made in 1965. Now, it's a good place for us to look at this. Someone has stripped off the electronics. There's two holes here and a hole for a the wire for the pickup. And there's another set of the same holes down here. There's a tone and volume control and probably some switch that went back and forth. But this thing has all of its original hardware. Uh, somebody got lipstick on it right here. I thought that was a crack, but it's not. The binding on this thing is great. It's a it's a big body, almost looks like a Gibson Super 400. If you can run across these things, this is what you're after. I am not going to junk pile this one up. It's missing the uh, pit guard, uh, but it's got great tuners on it. Everything is here. Um, so I think I'm just going to be in the market to put this one back like it was. Um, no buckle rash. It got a little chips and everything, but again, the binding. I love these pocket necks where they just drop right in and glue in. The Harmony Brilliant. Great guitar. Now, this one is going to put you over the top. I guarantee it. You've seen this one before if you are a regular viewer. We did an episode called Hector's Guitar. This is an airline. This was made in 1958. It's a model 6550 and it's the equal to the K Pacer, the K Pacer. It is all original dual speed bump pickups three-way switch volume and tone control this thing is completely original this is Coveter's Paradise I'm not going to do anything with this one but let it lay um, oddly enough I was working on this one trying to get it it came with the original amplifier that it had an airline amp. So this is a Christmas package in 1958. This thing is in pristine condition. The funny part about it is it came with the original strap. And look at this. It has this original olive green case. What is this? Easy Bake Oven 1964 olive green case. Um, it's got a fuzzy soft inside. This must be alpaca wool, uh, but this was quite the find. So, by the time the late 50s, early 60s came along, the electric guitar was the thing you wanted for Christmas. Again, there's a ton of electric guitars. Um, I'm only showing you what I have around. Now, let's get to the cream of the crop the ones that you wish you would have got for Christmas and the ones that you still do want for Christmas. I got two special ones that you're going to want to see. All right. Are you ready for this? I don't think you are um, because it makes absolutely no sense. In terms of what I'm going to show you, the quality of what I'm going to show you, um, yeah, no, it doesn't make any sense. Unless you think about how cool the cars looked in the mid to late 50s where you had two-tone stuff going on. You had the Oldsmobiles, you had the Chevys, you had the Buicks, the big boats. It had the top one color like Chick Flick Teal uh, and the other. It didn't matter as long as they had Chick Flick Teal, right? So there's two guitars I'm going to show you. I did an episode about this um, in which many of you coveted uh, everything because there wasn't just one but there was two of these guitars so here it is reminding you that this was a mid-level low-quality guitar at best 
People still wanted them. They still freaked out. There are people living unfulfilled Christmases in their 60s and even 70s because they didn't get it for Christmas. Here it is, the Silver Tone 9835 Kentucky Blue Archtop. Ooh, ah. What? Be careful, I'm falling over. Ooh, ah. Do, 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 do. Yes, there they are. Um, again, <laughs> mid level uh, quality, not a student instrument, but not that far off. This pick guard is uh, make them thin, you will win. That's all I'll say about that. But yeah, fancy two tone paint job. Uh, the ones that were in greenish, and I think there's a yellowy tan. Those ones are more rare, but yeah, this is the one you want. And yeah, I'm going to wrap this one up for myself for Christmas. But wait, <laughs> there's more. This wouldn't be enough for me. There's one other one that I want and you want too. You just don't know it till I show you. Be right back. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm not Bob Log the Third, but I do try to play him on my channel. Um, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, this is the Airline 5890 Tuxedo made in the 1950s. If I'm going to open up my Christmas present, this is the one I want. So it just goes to show you that if you tape your hat on a Bob Log helmet and you leave the camera on without taking an annoying break, people are going to see that you still have a full head of hair even when you're as old as this guitar right here. Is this thing not beautiful? It's got a Curtis Novak pickup on it. It's got a piezo, uh, a jack for both. It's got a volume control. But other than that, this thing is pretty much all original. So, let's cut to the chase and give you a quick look. This is what you wanted to see your whole life. Go ahead, take a picture. All right, guys, I've really enjoyed this. I'm pretty fortunate. Um, to run across and have access to the guitars that I do. If you see something on here that really interested you, um, my emails at the end of the uh, episode, just give me a shout out in an email and let's talk. The junkier stuff is ready to go with your name on it. I just have to have a few questions and then I can look you up on the internet and I can, I've had people say to me, this thing is so me, you must have been in my underwear drawer. It's like, no, don't flatter yourself, dude. But yeah, pretty much. So I'm in the business of taking junky old guitars that people would throw away from the island of guitars that nobody wanted. It's kind of like the island of toys that nobody wanted, but just a little bit past there and past the mattresses and the piles of, uh, of uh, drywall. And then just, just follow it. You'll see. You'll see. Anyway, thanks for watching. I've enjoyed this. If you haven't subscribed yet, give me a subscription and a like. I've got some really cool stuff, practical stuff coming ahead. Hey, happy holidays, guys. 
Thanks for watching me and supporting my channel the best to you and yours. Stay safe during the holidays.